This is a brief introduction to spatial analysis. Uh, and in general, starting out, we want to answer the question what analysis is. And analysis for us is what analysts do. And more generally, um, what analysts do in response to unknowns or questions from public and private organizations and individuals. And what they do is they produce reports um, that are typically written. Uh, they can be tabular, quantitative, or qualitative. And they may include graphical elements as well of various kinds. Uh, analysts typically use database management systems, uh, statistical analysis, and synthesis of multidisciplinary logics to answer questions. So analysts produce reports that answer questions or queries from entities that are unknown. They answer and respond to unknowns, both in the physical and human worlds. Spatial analysts do all of this. They do everything that analysts do that were, was just mentioned above. But in addition, they use geographic information systems and other geotechnologies to produce reports. And so in addition to all the things that analysts do, geospatial analysts produce reports that include maps. And these can be uh, conventional maps, paper maps, or uh, more smarter maps, web maps, or web applications that are uh, map enabled. Uh, they also can include image maps, maps that are, that are fundamentally images that can be smart images, classified images, images that have intelligence that's been added to them by the analyst, uh, or uh, other types of images that uh, add value or add information to the raw images that are collected. They also may include uh, geodatabases, the geodata that they have formatted in particular ways to, uh, to be useful to public or private um, entities. And the, they, in the end, they do produce reports uh, just like any other analyst, but their reports may also include these elements that were just mentioned, and they can be quantitative, uh, and or qualitative reports that, uh, again, are synthetic, that draw on um, multidisciplinary logic and knowledge to answer questions, to answer unknowns that are uh, posed to those analysts by public and private entities. Now, when we look at the six functional capabilities of geographic information systems, we can see that we've really been doing most of these through uh, our work uh, here being introduced to geographic information systems. And um, in particular, we've, we've also been doing spatial analysis, really starting right out this term. We started out doing spatial analysis when we were doing choropleth mapping. Uh, we're doing other forms of mapping now, and we'll continue to uh, build our skills in the area of uh, spatial analysis. So uh, in, this, in this particular introduction, we want to uh, discuss several basic spatial analysis functions that a spatial analyst may uh, use or uh, perform. And these include uh, selection and classification, which we've mentioned previously. It may include dissolving which is a relatively simple process, but can also uh, become a bit more uh, complex, depending on how it's performed. Um, proximity functions and buffering. And then uh, later on, we'll also be discussing uh, overlay. And overlay really is part of just about everything that we do in GIS, whether it's mentioned or not. Um, and it, it will be mentioned in this uh, brief introduction, and then we'll also later we'll discuss somewhat network analysis uh, 
and ultimately interpolation or spatial estimation. Selection is what we do as GIS analysts to extract subsets of features from larger geodata sets and geodatabases based on particular criteria. Now, uh, we've demonstrated this before in class, and the uh, criteria that are uh, used and that are useful can be either uh, attribute criteria using normal logics uh, around the descriptions of these features or in the descriptive and quantitative attributes of these features, or they can also be um, spatial uh, spatial selection criteria that are used to extract uh, subsets of features. Uh, in this instance, I'm looking at the Cook County geodemographic or demographic uh, data set on census tracts from census 2010, and I've created a fairly simple query here that will uh, extract the subset of census tracts that are greater than 20 percent in the um, in the in the attribute of people who are of age 20 to 24. So you can see I've produced that query. The query has extracted from the table 27 out of 1,319 census tracts that you can see here in the map are uh, census tracts that have greater than 20 percent uh, folks who are uh, between the ages of 20 and 24. Classification we've been doing since the start of term and we tend to overlook this and think that it's a relatively simple operation and it is relatively simple, it can be relatively simple, but it really has a uh, somewhat profound effect on data sets that we work with, quantitative uh, data sets that we work with. And so we want to particularly highlight this and make sure that everyone understands that this is a form of analysis, it's an important form of analysis, it's something that is used in uh, really in most geospatial analysis that's done. Uh, in, in this instance, again, I'm, I'm working with um, some choropleth examples here, and I'm looking at uh, the percentage of population, 20 to 24, and so I'm mapping this as a choropleth map, and you can see here the uh, histogram and the classification dialog for that, uh, that data set. And uh, what, I'm, uh, what I've done here is I've used a classification scheme that's an equal interval classification scheme. And so you can see the resulting uh, break values, and I am excluding the zero value here. You can see the resulting break values of the five classes, and then the, um, the actual uh, class breaks graphically in the histogram, and then the map that's produced by this classification scheme, the equal interval classification scheme, where the minimum and the maximum range is divided by the number of classes, and then the classes are arbitrarily spaced along, evenly spaced along that range from lowest to highest, uh, lowest to highest values in the data set. Here's a second example, the exact same data set, a different decision by the uh, analyst, and now we're using um, natural breaks, and in natural breaks, natural breaks is intended to, uh, to use the data set to establish uh, break values between classes that are in the largest gaps within the data set that are in the, these 
quote unquote natural gaps within the data set. And so again, you can see the resulting break values, the histogram, where the break values occur within the data set, within the histogram, and uh, within this, this graphic. And then here you see the resulting map. Again, this is same data set, natural breaks. Completely different map. Okay. Here's the exact same data set using quantiles. And so in each of these examples, we have the same number of classes, same data set. The only difference is the classification scheme or the classification method that's being used. And in all of these, we are excluding zero. In quantiles, as you know, uh, again, the classification responds to the character of the data set. In quantiles, we force the, uh, force the classification to include uh, an equal number of values, an equal number of features in each of the five classes. And so, as you can see, the classification, uh, the, the ranges uh, are very narrow where there are a lot of values and then they're much wider where there are fewer values. And so, you know, a very large area of the histogram is uh, stretched from, um, you know, from the, in that, in that top class. It has the largest range that particular class does. And again, uh, this is in response to the character of the data set. And it produces a map that has a fairly nice uh, range of um, of values across the map that that uh, illustrate you know illustrate again this same data set that we're working with same data same number of classes only difference is quantile quantile uh, classification and we get a completely different uh, completely different result right completely different map. And finally, here's a geometrical interval. And a, a geometrical interval classification is more or less a, uh, a compromise between the quantile and the, uh, and the natural breaks classification scheme that tends to uh, use natural breaks, quote unquote natural breaks, within the, within the system, but also highlights the middle values somewhat and emphasizes the middle values more uh, specifically than a normal natural break um, natural break classification would but also uh, allows for some discrimination at the higher end uh, or the lower end of a, uh, a histogram or a data set than a quantile classification would so it's something of a compromise between natural breaks and uh, quantile classification. The dissolve function is a, it's an important function and it's typically used with data that's been classified. In this uh, example, I'm showing uh, the data set that we've been working with, the uh, population from 20 to 24, and it's classified by geometrical interval. And in dissolve, the uh, classifications are combined into individual polygons and these are actually separate polygons so we've gone from over 1300 polygons on the left to five polygons on the right now it looks like multiple polygons but these are actually special kinds of polygons they're termed multi-part polygons so all of each class whether they're separate um, graphical polygons or not are a single record in the attribute table for this new layer. Now the new, the new dissolved layer can be produced graphically relatively simply within the uh, properties dialog in the symbology tab uh, in ArcGIS or it can also be dissolving can al also be done more analytically using a dissolve tool um, in the toolbox that will produce um, an actual separate layer, a new dissolved layer that includes for all the attributes various statistics like sums, means, and so on as new attributes for 
uh, for these um, these these classified multipart polygons. Proximity functions are used typically to analyze the spatial relationships between uh, different entities in space and to to really answer questions about um, what are the spatial relationships between different entities and ultimately uh, if we know about other kinds of relationships proximities um, proximities being either favorable or unfavorable to those entities then you know these become can become part of more complex uh, explanations and models that we include in our our reports that we uh, that we will produce uh, in this example I'm looking at toxic release inventory releases for 2010 in Cook County and I've used a selection routine to select uh, toxic release inventory facilities that released greater than 100,000 pounds in 2010 and then I've created a five mile uh, polygon buffer bit stretched in the east and west um, because of the project projection that's being used but a five mile polygon buffer that is um, that is you know just a, a buffer for these uh, facilities that were uh, selected by that criteria that we were using so this is a specialized vector polygon buffer derived from a point layer this is a uh, line buffer that was generated from obviously a line layer this is the streams layer for Cook County and again with the same uh, TRI 2010 sites I'm using a one mile buffer polygon buffer on Cook streams to select TRI sites so I've selected TRI sites within Cook County that are within one mile Euclidean distance that straight line distance uh, perpendicular from these principally linear features uh, to uh, select these features so I've used this used this buffer as a tool after creating the buffer more or less as a cookie cutter to select TRI features that intersect with the polygon buffer so again it's, it's kind of stunning when you look at this to see how few of these TRI sites are greater than one mile from a hydrographic feature in Cook County. In this example, I'm using a polygon uh, polygon data set, and I've selected uh, census tracts. This is that same census uh, census demographics 2010 data set that we've worked with earlier and that I showed earlier, and I've selected a data set of uh, polygons that are um, fo that have populations of folks from 20 to 24 greater than 20 percent and so I've used those polygons to create a one mile buffer those selected polygons to create a one mile buffer from those polygons and then taking those polygons I've used them as a selection tool to select TRI sites that are within one mile of census tracts that include greater than 20 percent population of the age 20 to 24 and again you can see the results of this it selects a very specific subset of TRI sites toxic release inventory sites on the uh, west side of, of uh, downtown Chicago that are within a one mile proximity of census tracts that are mainly around universities in Chicago containing uh, folks who are of the uh, uh, over 20 percent uh, folks who are of the age 20 to 24. We can also use uh, proximity functions to create raster 
data sets. And these are, these are very useful in many ways. Um, in this instance, I've used the TRI uh, data from 2010 for Cook County, the T TRI facilities layer from Cook County. That uh, I've used that to create a raster Euclidean distance uh, surface, a continuous surface. And so in, in, uh, as opposed to using a, uh, a, a raster, I'm sorry, a, a layer to create a vector data set, when you create a raster uh, data set, you can actually create values for the entire area of interest, in this case, all of Cook County. And so we have information on the distance, Euclidean distance, which is straight line distance, to all of the, or any of the uh, TRI facilities. And so the distance that's plotted for a given raster cell, or calculated for a given raster cell, is a straight line distance to the nearest uh, TRI site within the county. Now, to do a complete analysis, you'd probably want to do the counties around Cook County as well, because there may be facilities that are close to the border that are closer than some of the, uh, some of the ones that are, you know, plotted within the county. But when this analysis is performed, a, a straight line distance to the nearest TRI site is calculated for each grid cell, and depending on how uh, how you you um, do the analysis and the size of the grid cells that you use, which can be very very small, uh, there are a lot of calculations that have to be done. So you have you have to first calculate um, you have to calculate all of the uh, the locations of the 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 grid cell uh, center points. And then you have to compare that to a table of locations for all of the TRI sites and calculate uh, distance to all of the TRI sites from each grid cell. This calculation has to be done for each grid cell. And then the comparison has to be performed to determine which is the, which is the closest site. And that, that distance is, that lowest distance is the, uh, is the distance that's that's uh, recorded in a grid cell. And for in this particular analysis, this was done for um, hundreds of thousands of grid cells uh, in, in Cook County to, to create this continuous surface. Now, um, why is this useful? Well, uh, in fact, what, what we do, what we can do now is we can take this and we can take this continuous surface and we can apply these values to features like census tracts, for instance. In this instance, we've summarized the uh, values within each census tract and we've extracted those values to the census tracts. And so the census tract vector data set of polygons now includes uh, mean values, min, max values, and median and range values for the distance to the nearest TRI site. So this is a this is a, a statistic that we've created um, using spatial analysis that really is in some ways a measure of spatial justice, right? Of spatial environmental justice. And again, uh, I don't think you have to really think very deeply to, to uh, understand whether it's good or bad or fair or unfair to be close or not close to a toxic release inventory facility. Now this has been a brief introduction to uh, some aspects of geospatial analysis. And next week we'll be looking at uh, another uh, important um, function that we perform as spatial analysts, uh, the function of interpolation or spatial estimation.